Good morning, good morning, uh, brothers and sisters. It's great to be with you again this morning. It's such an, uh, a great, great privilege to be sharing the word of the Lord. And, you know, Jesus is doing incredible things and uh, he's calling us, he's awakening our hearts. He's purifying us, he's purging us. You know, one of the things that has to happen constantly is a sanctification in our lives. Uh, so that we will be able to reflect our true identity in Christ Jesus. And why is this so? Because we're so influenced by the culture around us, you know, consciously and unconsciously. We have a lot of baggage in our souls that Jesus needs to uh, sanctify with his word, the purification that comes through his word. And over the last few uh, weekends, as we have uh, gone through this lessons, uh, we were going through these lessons I believe that's what the Lord is doing. He's calling us to awake. He's calling us to th this place of who we are. He's saying to the church, look, guys, you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, uh, a people set apart for God, meaning that our thinking, our words, our actions, our lifestyle must reflect the, the values of the kingdom of uh, God. It, it has to reflect kingdom values. So that is what the Lord is doing. And it's a great place for us to be because we don't want to be caught out asleep. We don't want to be caught out uh, compromising and complacent. We don't want to be caught out having allegiance to anything around us uh, rather than Jesus Christ. So it is such a great privilege uh, for us to be in this journey. And uh, we continue today uh, as we uh, look at the lessons to the uh, the lessons from the letters to the churches, and and we're going to be reading from uh, Revelations two, from uh, chapter twelve. We're going to be looking at the church in Pergamum. So we've been traveling from Ephesus. Uh, we we went through Smyrna last weekend. A powerful church, uh, a church that was under persecution that stood their ground. A church that refused to succumb to the pressures around them. And, and the fact that because of that, Satan hated them and wanted to destroy them. He couldn't destroy them internally. So he was trying to destroy them externally. Where Jesus comes and says, be faithful unto death. So we've come through uh, the city of Smyrna. Now we are traveling up about 15 miles uh, towards Pergamum. So we've come to Pergamum today. So let's read uh, Revelations 2 from verses 12 uh, through to 17. Revelations 2 uh, verses 12 through to 17. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him e hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of, the old, some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Hallelujah. Let's pray as we come before the word of the Lord. Father, we thank you for the power of your word. Jesus, we thank you that you are speaking to us right now. Here in the United Kingdom, you are speaking to the church and you are calling us to awake. You're calling us 
to turn, to repent. You're calling us to yield to the sanctifying work of the Spirit so that you will fulfill your purposes in us and through us and that you can uh, usher in uh, the influence of your kingdom like never before. Father, we pray right now, I ask you, let the spirit of wisdom be released upon each and everyone who is listening right now, that our hearts will receive understanding. Holy Spirit, help us to have humility to accept what you are saying, not just my word, but your word, your word, a word that is coming from you. Give us that strength, that courage, that humility to receive your word and to turn and to change and to be empowered and to be energized like never before. This moment I speak and I silence and I resist the spirit of deception. I wage war, I fight and I defeat the spirit of deception. That is a work in our lives. It is a work in the church, in this town, in this nation and the nations of the world. Let your word run swiftly this morning. And we receive you, Lord Jesus, right now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So uh, we are in Pergamum, uh, 15 miles away from the city of Smyrna. This was a political center uh, for the whole of Asia Minor. And decisions that were made here affected the whole of Asia. So it's a very important uh, city. It, it was a very important city uh, politically uh, for the whole of uh, Asia Minor. It had been the provincial capital uh, for Asia Minor for more than 300 years. So Pergamon was a provincial capital for Asia Minor for more than 300 years. It was a very literate and cultured city. Uh, uh, it was a center of, for education. So there would be very educated people around that place. If people need educating, they will come there. And uh, if I think about place, I think Oxford, uh, because of the university uh, and the kinds of uh, educational uh, systems in that place. Uh, and so Pergamon was like that. It was a very cultured city. Uh, where they had a famous library with over 200 parchment. And parchment uh, for us now will be books. 200,000 parchment. Uh, these were uh, materials made from animal skins that they used for copying uh, or writing on. And um, it, 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 was, it was here that parchment was invented. So the, the parchment was invented in Pergamon. Um, it, it was... It, it, this was a city also uh, famous and zealous for idol worship and, and also known as the center for the imperial cult. Uh, they had three temples built and dedicated to the worship of the Roman emperor. So the imperial cult is the, uh, uh, you know, the kind of worship and religious practice around the emperor, where they worshipped the emperor. And it got to a point, as I said last weekend, it was demanded. You know, people were doing that willingly and it was demanded. So again, this was a very intelligent environment, but yet idol worship was going on. Um, three temples has been built dedicated to the worship of the Roman emperor. Now, these temples were built on a hilltop high above the city. It also had temples built there for other Greek gods, uh, Asclepius and Zeus. Um, all citizens were expected to participate in civ civic religion, and most citizens wanted to participate in imperial festivals and eat meat of sacrificed animals, giving out at many of the pagan festivals. And so, uh, you know, this was an environment again where idol worship was going on, uh, in as much as they were a cultured and illiterate people, yet, you know, I mean, their religion was a mixture. It wasn't separate. Uh, they weren't atheist. No, they were polytheist. They, they worshipped different kinds of uh, gods and uh, worshipped the emperor. Uh, and, and this was just an intensive, uh, very demonic environment. You know, uh, a lot of sacrifices going on. And so we have the famous giant altar of Zeus, which... Uh, was erected in that place overlooking the city on its citadel and was built there and is now situated 
in the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. So at some point, Hitler, uh, uh, you know, uh, tasked people to transport this altar built in Pergamon and they brought it to Germany. So you can find that altar in Germany and uh, we're going to see some uh, pictures of that. Uh, so the altar of Zeus. And, and now uh, also we had the Asclepion, which was a temple built and dedicated to Asclepius. This was situated there, which is the temple built uh, for the Greek god Asclepius, uh, which is the ancient Greek god of healing and knowledge. This god was uh, represented by a rod and a snake around the rod. Again, we can see that uh, image, uh, uh, the Asclepius rod. Uh, because of this famous temple to the Roman god of healing, sick and diseased people from all over the Roman Empire flocked to Pergamon for relief. So, you know, this temple of Asclepion, uh, again, they were engaging demonic power to bring healing to people. People traveled all, all over the uh, uh, Asia Minor, came there. And if you were admitted into the temple, what happened was in the night, they put you in uh, uh, some of the spaces in the temple. And in the temple, there was loads of uh, uh, harmless snakes in the temple. And what happened was, uh, if you were lying down in the middle of the night, these snakes will actually slither around you, crawl around you, and it was considered as the touch of the gods. It was considered as the touch of the gods to get snakes to slither around you, to bring healing and wholeness to you. Also, uh, you know, you've got the altar of Zeus where uh, there was constant smoke because of the sacrifice. And, and so this was a a demonic place. It was a demonic place. And we, we see in scripture how Jesus considered that place as the throne of Satan and the place where Satan dwelt. So this was the environment that the believers were in. They were in an environment where the imperial cult was situated right there. It was demanded of them to worship the emperor. And then you had all this uh, uh, demonic rituals going on and, uh, you know, sacrifices going on 247 uh, smoke going up into the air and then you had this temple of Asclepius there where you know they were engaging demonic power to bring healing to people and, and so this was that environment that they were in that was going to be uh, a challenging environment so let's come to the text let's come to the text so Jesus starts by saying that and to the angel of the church in Pegamon write the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword and as we, again, is highlighted here, the order, the order, Jesus brings the word of God to the leadership of the church. And the leadership have a responsibility to bring that word as Jesus wants it to be. Again, I don't have the responsibility uh, over anything else. My responsibility is to bring the word of the Lord to the body of Christ and to see that the body of Christ is built in such a way that Jesus wants it. You know, Jesus said that I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. How does Jesus build his church? Through the revelation of the word of God. Through the word of God. The, the word of God is the only thing that builds your life. The word of God, the power of the word of God is what you need. If you need building uh, spiritually, if you need building in your mind, in any area of your life, it is the power of the word of God that can build you. And that's the word that is brought uh, by the Anglos, by the uh, messenger, by the spiritual leadership of the church. And then Jesus said, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword in his mouth. Now, this is so important. Every church has a salutation. And that salutation is not random. It's for a purpose. And, and, you know, Jesus now highlights his warrior identity. Remember, we looked at what that word means, because in Revelation 1, we saw that, uh, uh, you know, the Bible had said that this is the one who had the um, two-edged sword in his mouth. That that sword is a, is a sword to, to bring judgment and to make war. Okay, now Jesus now, he's bringing his judgment to the church. He's bring, and you know, judgment is an evaluation that God brings to us 
first and foremost. He weighs us in the balance. And if we are wanting, he brings us that information so that we can allow the word of God to bring correction in our lives. And so Jesus now is highlighting his warrior identity. So the sword is for war. It's an offensive weapon. Remember in the book of Ephesians, the Bible says we should take the sword of the spirit. It is the only offensive weapon we have. So Jesus now is highlighting his identity as a warrior. And therefore, he's pointing out the church's warrior identity in Christ. Brothers and sisters, the church of Jesus Christ is God's own elite end time army. God has raised us up in this end time to stand our ground, not to compromise with the culture, no, but to stand as a holy nation, as a people different with our orders coming from our commander Jesus and pushing and penetrating darkness, invading our culture with the truth and the light and love of Jesus, rescuing men from the bondage of darkness, breaking the power of darkness and bringing freedom to people and ushering in the reality and the influence of the king and his kingdom. So Jesus is highlighting this crucial thing that we are warriors. You are a warrior. You are a warrior of Christ. You, you are not an insignificant person. No, you are a mighty warrior. Your commander, Jesus Christ, gives you orders from his word. You take that and you go and you execute. Listen, the Bible said that we are seated with Christ Jesus in heavenly places, far above principalities and power. Satan does not have authority over us. No, we have authority over Satan. We cannot submit to any other authority but the authority of Jesus Christ. And that is it. And that is it. So Jesus highlights not just his warrior identity, but he points out our warrior identity. Jesus is a warrior. In the book of Exodus chapter 15, verse 3, the Bible says that the Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Jeremiah 20, verse 11. The Lord is with me like a mighty warrior. Psalms 24, verse 8. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Isaiah 42, verse 13. The Lord will go forth like a warrior. He will stir up his zeal like a soldier. He will shout, yes, he will roar. He will prevail against his enemies. Hallelujah. He, Jesus, is prevailing against his enemies. The church of Jesus Christ, we have to rise up in this true identity of ours, in this warrior identity. And it is in only this warrior identity will we prevail against the enemies that we are seeing right now. And I want to call you, I want to challenge you. Take on that armor, step into your true identity as a warrior of, of Jesus Christ, as a warrior of the kingdom of heaven and prevail against your enemies, prevail against what is here. We have to prevail. And I want to call the church in the United Kingdom that you must rise up in this UK right now, in this time where everything is going crazy, in this time where they're trying to shut us down. Satan is trying to shut the church down. We have to rise up in truth and empower and represent the kingdom of God and press through and prevail against the forces of darkness as Jesus is. And now in Revelations 19 verse 11, the Bible said, then I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse and its rider is called faithful and true. That's Jesus. With righteousness, he judges and wages war. The Bible says this is the word of him who has the two sharp edged sword in his mouth. And we must pay attention right now. He's, he's invoking his, his, his right as a judge and as a, a person, as an individual, as a king who wages war against evil, against the infestation of darkness in this earth, in our life, and even in the church. He's coming to the church in Pergamum. And he's bringing his judgment and he's beginning to wage war 
against the infiltration of darkness in his church. And I want to say this, that that is what Jesus is doing right now. He's, in, he's bringing his word to, to, to wage war and to bring judgment of the infiltration of darkness and the culture in his church right now in the UK. Hallelujah. This weapon is for fighting and defeating sin and Satan. And whenever we allow the culture to influence us, we move in that direction. We must take we must make use of this weapon as Jesus does. The sword of the spirit. We must take the sword of the spirit. He is the one who has this, the, the sharp two-edged sword in his mouth. He continues to say, verses 13. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name. And you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas. My faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. He says, I know where you dwell. I know. Not I know about, I know it. But, but there's something here I want us to consider. Jesus knows because he walks amongst the lampstands. You remember Revelation 1 verse 20? He says, I walk, um, I saw, John saw him walking amongst us. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is walking amongst us right now. What we are doing, he is watching, he's, he is observing. And the reality is that he has the right perspective about everything. So, so now we, we see that he says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is and where Satan dwells. Jesus brings a spiritual perspective about the state in which Pergamum was in. He gives a spiritual perspective about the condition and the reality of Pergamum. And, and why does he call it this Satan's throne? Uh, you've got the mixture of the altar of Zeus, the imperial cult, and the temple of Asclepius, and the fact that they were burning in, uh, they were sacrificing and all these demonic things going on there. It, it, it is the total of the dark spiritual lifestyle of Pergamum, which included all the idol worship, emperor worship, demonic sacrifices, satanic rituals, and the deep immorality that is so normal within that culture. You know, Jesus brings a spiritual identification of Pergamum. Now, this is important, brothers and sisters, because I, I'm not sure whether the church in Pergamum saw that Pergamum was the dwelling place of Satan and was the throne of Satan. I, I, I doubt it. I, I'm not sure. And the question we have to ask is, do we know the spiritual perspective of the natural, of our geographical em environment. Do, do we know the spiritual condition of Basingstoke? Do we know the spiritual condition of the United Kingdom? Do we know the spiritual condition of the culture? How does our culture look from the place of the spirit? Do, do we know that? Do, do you know the natural condition of your family? Do you know the spirit, the, the spirits that rule in your family? Do you know the spirits that rule in this town, in this nation? Do we know that we, because we must capture that spiritual image. Because Jesus brought it to that church. He says, I know where you dwell. Satan's throne, Satan's dwelling place. And we must have a Holy Spirit Biblical view of our culture so that we don't fall to the temptation to compromise with the culture. You know, one of the things that fascinated me when I came to the UK is a kind of order in this place. Very beautiful environment. If you're flying over United Kingdom, it looks very organized. You know, uh, all the hedges are cut here in town. They keep it clean. All the houses are rightly organized. There is a, a, a look, it's beautiful during Christmas time. It's beautiful on the outside. You know, there's trees, there's lights and all kinds of beauty on the outside. But the question was, 
did I know the spiritual state in which this nation looked? Did, did, could I see United Kingdom from a spiritual place? Now, I can tell you one thing, that as beautiful and, 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 and as lovely as it looks on the outside, as far as the spiritual realm is concerned, as far as the moral realm is concerned, our culture is in a very dark place as far as morally and spiritually is concerned. Hallelujah. We must, we must see from the spirit the condition of our culture, the state in which the culture looks like. We don't want to be caught up with looking at things on the outside. No. No. So Jesus comes and he says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. He says, yet you hold fast my name and you did not deny my faith. They knew the culture. They knew the condition that they were in. And they stood their ground in the midst of that dark culture. They did not deny the name of Jesus. They did not deny the faith of Jesus that was in them. They didn't succumb to the uh, uh, you know, external pressures that was coming against them. And I'm using external because we're going to go to the next phase in a minute. They didn't succumb to it. And, and, and you know, brothers and sisters, let's not confuse how the culture looked like on the outside to how it looks like spiritually. One of the things I keep telling my children is, look, I'm raising and preparing you for war because this is a culture that is in a dark place. Education is being infused with darkness and perversion and sexual immorality has become a norm in our environment right now. As we're speaking, you know, on news, uh, the U.S. government is, is, is investigating this massive uh, pedophilia uh, agenda that is happening around the world. And, and apparently there's uh, some uh, celebrities and all these people involved in it. On the outside, they look good. But in the spirit, there is a stench. There is a darkness. And, and so I say to my kids, look, it looks nice out there. But morally, it's a dark place. Morally and spiritually is a dark place. And we can't confuse how it looks on the outside with how it looks on the inside. Because if we do, we're susceptible to denying his name and denying the faith. And they didn't do that even when one of their folks died. You know, one of the stories I read about uh, uh, Antipas was how he died. In those days, they, they had this uh, a, a metal bull. And they would put people in this metal bull. And they would set fire underneath the bull. And literally, they would bake in that bull till death. They would make noise. And there's a small uh, a sort of hole that was made at the mouth of the bull. And as they were groaning in pain, it sounded like the bull uh, uh, was, was sort of um, making noise. And apparently that is how Antipas was killed. Now think about it. Even in the midst of that, they didn't deny his name. External pressure could not break them down. The threat of persecution could not stop them from standing their ground. Ladies and gentlemen, the Lord is calling you and I as his people to stand our ground right now. This is no time to show our allegiance to anything else, to, to anyone else, but to Jesus. This is not the time to show our allegiance and commitment to the natural, to the culture. No, this is the time to stand our ground, not to deny his name, not to deny the faith, that faith that he paid with his precious blood for us. We have to stand our ground just as our brothers and sisters did. The Bible says that they stood their ground even though Antipas was killed where Satan dwells. Let's go to verse 14. He says, but I have a few things against you. You have some who, uh, you, 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 you have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, 
who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So Jesus highlights something called the teaching of Balaam, which is a story that comes from the book of Numbers between 22 and I think 25, uh, where Israel had camped close to Moab. And the whole of Moab were in fear because of what God had been doing with the, with the Jewish people, with the Israelites. They knew that if the Israelite was to come out to invade Moab, they were going to prevail. So the king of Moab called Balak, uh, he knew he could not take them out naturally. So what happened was he had to employ Balaam to try and curse them. And each time Balaam tried to do that, God stopped Balaam from cursing Israel because whom God has blessed, God will not authorize you to curse anyone he has blessed. No. And this is a call. We are called to be a blessing to the people of Israel. We're called to pray and to seek the salvation of the people of Israel. And so what happened was Balaam tried to curse them. It wasn't working. And then finally, he came up with another strategy that if I cannot destroy them from the outside, I will try to destroy them from the inside. So what did he do? He made Balak organize a massive party. I'm paraphrasing here. And invited the Jewish men. When they came, there were women, Moabite women. Remember, God had told them that, look, when you go into that land, don't mix with them. No, don't, don't, don't marry those people. Uh, don't in, be, uh, you know, um, equally yoked with these people because they will draw you into idol worship. They will, call, they will cause you to stumble. They will cause you to, de to deny me. They will cause you to open up yourself to demonic and satanic activities. So don't get amongst them. So, so Balaam's strategy now was to get them to sin against God and to get God to destroy them, to, to, to bring them under the judgment of God. And that's exactly what he achieved. Suddenly, these uh, Jewish men saw these Moabites women enticing the men. They went in, not even just marrying them, they started sleeping with them. That was how the situation was. And this is a known strategy of Satan. If Satan cannot destroy the church on the outside, he will try to destroy us from the inside out. And so now what happened was suddenly a plague striked the people of Israel and thousands and thousands of people were killed. And finally, atonement was made and it was a strange atonement uh, because there was a Jewish man who came in whilst the priest and the elders were there. He came in with a, Jew, a Moabite woman and was going to sleep with them. And one of the priests took a, a spear and drove it in them. And they were both killed. And then suddenly the plague stopped. But what happened was Balaam had enticed the people of Israel to sin against God by engaging in idol worship and immorality. That, that's the whole uh, story of Balaam right here. And so, and so the teaching of Balaam is, is a satanic strategy to, to weaken the church and to make us ineffective, first of all, by grieving the Holy Spirit. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a satanic strategy. He, he causes us to lower our standards so that we will grieve the Holy Spirit. And I tell you what, you don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. We don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. No, we don't want a church that is void of power. No. He is the life of the church. So, so if Satan cannot destroy us on the outside, he will try to destroy us from the inside out. The teaching of Balaam is any teaching that in a subtle way depletes our loyalty and allegiance and faithfulness to Jesus. Any teaching you hear that causes you and me to deplete in our loyalty and allegiance to Jesus 
is the teaching and the doctrine of Balaam. Where suddenly you have a split allegiance. You have an allegiance to either your marriage or your job or, or, or the government or systems or the wealth or your family. Suddenly all those things become much more important to you than Jesus. That is a teaching of Balaam. Is a teaching, any kind of teaching that encourages the church to accept the standards of this world in the name of wanting to win them to Christ. That is the teaching of Balaam. We, we, we are accepting the standards of the world. It, now we, we are trying to look like the people of the world. We're trying to look like the people of the world. That is the teaching of Balaam. It is the kind of teaching that causes us not to exalt the word of God above anything or anyone else. Again, we live in a time where the Bible said in the last days, many will depart from the faith. Many will follow after their own ways. Why? Because we begin to dumb down the word of God. Oh, it doesn't matter if you don't pray. It doesn't really matter if you don't read your Bible. You know, it doesn't matter if you don't fellowship with believers. It doesn't matter, you know, you can go to church on a Sunday and go back home and get your roast and it's fine, you're okay. You know, you don't have to witness the people. It's just, you know, it's your personality. There are people who have, uh, you know, great personalities. There are people who don't have to, you know, we, we don't have to sacrifice. You know, you just have to take everything nice and easy. All those teachings, what they're doing is they cause you to dumb down the word of God. When the Bible said in Psalms 128 that God has exalted his word above his name. Look, look, brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter what the culture says. What matters is what this word says. Our obligation is not to the culture, it's not to anything or anyone. It's to the word of the Lord. And so any teaching that causes us not to exalt the word of God above anything or anyone is a teaching of Balaam. It is the kind of teaching that causes us to compromise with our immediate culture so that people don't get offended because of the Christian lifestyle and message. Whenever you compromise or I compromise, just because we don't want people to be offended, we are subscribing to the doctrine and the teaching and the ideology of Balaam, which is not biblical or godly or of the spirit. It is satanic. Hallelujah. It is the kind of teaching that gears towards pleasing people instead of God. As the teaching and the idea and the ideology of Balaam. It is, it is a teaching that lures you. It looks good. Just as the, the people of Israel, they saw these women and it looked good. It looked good. They had forgotten that they were a royal priesthood. They had forgotten that they were a holy nation. They had forgotten that they had a blessing, which is God himself which is far important and far above anything else. The Bible says this. This Balaam taught uh, Balak to put a stumbling block so that they may eat food sacrificed to idols and, and the practice of sexual immorality. Idolatry. Uh, right. Idolatry now, again, the, the, the world in which we live in, our culture want us to worship idols. They want us to worship money power and sex they want us to worship pleasure and we can't no any teaching that prioritizes anything else above jesus is a teaching of Balaam. hallelujah a an idol is anything more important to you than god anything that absorbs your heart and your imagination more than god anything you seek to give you what only god can give you that is an idol a counterfeit God is anything so central and essential to your life that should you lose it, your life would feel hardly worth living. This is coming from a book called Counterfeit God by Tim Keller. I will recommend it for you. Get that book, Counterfeit God, and read it. It's a great blessing. But, but you see, an idol is anything in your life. When you lose it, your life will not be worth living. Oh. 
Anything can become an idol. Your marriage, your job, your status, your finances, anything, ministry, even as a pastor, I, that can become an idol. <laughs> yeah, that can become an idol. Ministry can become an idol. Hallelujah. And you know, the God of money, the God of pleasure, the God of sex and power, it rules and reigns in our culture. Brothers and sisters, we cannot be ignorant about the devices of the enemy. We can't be ignorant about the spiritual state in which our culture is in. That pleasure is one of the things that diffuses our, our spiritual life. Uh, you know, convenience and comfortability. What is convenient for us is holding us back from being zealous and from being on fire for Jesus. And anyone who tells you that there is nothing wrong with that, they have become a conduit of the teaching of Balaam. It is time, brothers and sisters, for us to wake up. It is time for us to realize that we live in a world that they're trying to get us to worship idols. We live in a world they're trying to get you to worship yourself. The Bible said in the last days, many will be lovers of self. Lovers of pleasure rather than God. And then he talks about sexual immorality. And let me read a quote from uh, one of the commentaries. Sexual immorality marked the whole culture of the ancient Roman Empire. It was simply taken, taken for granted. And, and the persons who lived by biblical standards of purity was considered strange. Yes, it is strange. It is strange now to say that you are virgin as a young person. It is strange. That's how strange it's become. <laughs> to paraphrase the Roman statesman Cicero, uh, cited in Berkeley, listen to what he said. If there is anyone who thinks that young men should not be allowed the love of many women, he is extremely severe. I am not able to deny the principle he stands on. But he contradicts not only with freedom, not only with the freedom our age allows, but also with the custom and allowances of our ancestors. When indeed, when indeed was this not done? When did anyone find fault with it? When was such permission denied? When was it that what is now allowed was not allowed? To keep from sexual immorality in that culture, you really have to swim against the current. Listen, brothers and sisters, the perversion in the world is pushing up against the church. Now, their, their ideas and ideologies where people are beginning to debate things as to homosexuality and all those things, when it is absolutely clear in scripture that it is sinful. There is no debate about this because the word of God doesn't debate it. And, and, and everything is pushing for the church to accept the standards of the culture when it comes to uh, morality and sexuality. And here that church had cowered. Satan could not destroy them on the outside. So now he was beginning to attack them from the inside to get them to lower their standard so that they would be in opposition against the purposes of God. And ladies and gentlemen, we have to rise up. We have to rise up in purity. We have to rise up in holiness. It is a challenge. It is a struggle. I know. But we have to stand our ground in Jesus' name. You know, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Our body, brothers and sisters, doesn't belong to us. It belongs to Jesus. Look at what he says. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Spirit? Who is in you? Whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God with your own body. 1 Peter 1 verse 8. It says, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life you inherited from your forefathers. Revelation 5 verse 9. It says, and they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. 
And with your blood, you have purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. Brothers and sisters, our body as children of God belongs to Jesus. It doesn't belong to the world. It doesn't belong to anyone. Jesus has paid with his precious blood. And he has entrusted it to us and he's calling us. He says, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. We are not obligated again to do what people say we should do. We are obligated to do alone what he, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who loved us and gave himself up for us, the one who loved us and freed us with his precious blood. We are only obligated to him. And we can't allow Satan to diffuse us when it comes to that inner life of purity. This was a church that were subscribing to this kind of teaching, this kind of ideology, this kind of words, this kind of thoughts, the teaching of Balaam, idolatry. They were beginning to worship money. They were beginning to worship sex. They were beginning to worship power, their fame, their reputation before the environment was more important to them than their reputation before Jesus. And Jesus comes and highlights that. Hallelujah. Verse 15. He says, so also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. And again, the Nicolaitans were people who would teach loose values who would teach in such a way that people did not have to show allegiance to to Jesus externally and internally especially internally oh yes you can go to church yeah you can go to church on a Sunday and then you can do what you want it's fine it's okay you know we make mistakes that is the teaching that was an erroneous teaching hallelujah verse 16 Jesus said therefore repent if not, I will come to you soon and I will war against them with the sword of my mouth. Now that is a strong word, brothers and sisters. It, could it be right now in the church in the UK, some part of the body is, is, is experiencing a war that Jesus himself is bringing against the church? Oh, man. He said, if they don't repent... I will come and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. <laughs> I wonder whether Jesus is fighting against some of us because we have refused to repent. And ladies and gentlemen, we want to have the humility to receive the word of God and say, Lord Jesus, yes, I've compromised with the culture. I I'm more concerned about what people think about me than what you think about me. Help me, Jesus. There needs to be a repentance, a turning, recognizing in humility where we have erred. And then we take the word of God and we allow the word to bring correction in our lives to prevent Jesus from coming and making war against us. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time for the church in Great Britain to recognize the places that it needs correcting, to bring repentance, to bring turning. We can't keep going on accepting anything and accepting the standards that are below the standard of the word of God and of the Holy Spirit. He says, therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with, my, with the sword of my mouth. We must recognize and acknowledge what Jesus is calling out in our lives and take practical steps from God's word to rectify the situation. Hallelujah. They must turn, we must turn from the errors and move towards righteous living and sound teaching. You know, we live in a time that there is a lot of pressure on leaders to speak the truth. As a pastor, you feel the pressure. You know, one of my spiritual responsibility is to wage war against the spirit of deception first of all in my life and to bring it to the church and and sometimes you know as a leader you can be concerned of whether people will like something or not whether they get offended or not and that is a challenge but but you want to pray for your pastor you want to pray for your church leader 
that he will be a person that will live under the leadership and lordship of Jesus. That regardless of the consequences, he will bring the truth of God's word and he himself will apply it to his own life. Hallelujah. I want to challenge you to pray for the leaders in the church, pastors in this United Kingdom, that they will be men and women committed to the truth of the word of God. And that Paul, as Paul said, woe is me if I preach not the gospel, that in their prayer closet, they will get into that secret place and they will build themselves up and they will say, woe is me if I speak and not stand on the truth of God's word. And so we must receive that correction. And we must turn and we must bring changes. And he says this, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit is saying to the churches. Right now, he's personalized it. Jesus is saying, you must hear this. In your life, if you have compromised with the culture, if you are living anyhow with low standards and you have been spoken to and you're not repenting, he says, if you don't repent, I will come and wage war against you. And the last person you want to stand in their way is Jesus Christ. I don't want to stand in his way. You don't want to stand in his way. We want him to bring that word and we humble ourselves and receive it and say, Lord, show me which areas do I need to change? Lord, show us here in Wessex, which areas do we need to turn? And brothers and sisters in Wessex, there is much for us to work on. There's much for us to work on in our prayer life, in our commitment to kingdom activity, in our willingness to stand our ground, in the place of love and unity amongst us. We must open up and say, Lord, we are here. Help us to yield to your correction because we don't want to stand in your way. We don't want to be individuals where you wage war against. And he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit is saying. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you and me. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. And I'll give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Jesus is calling our attention. In summary, Jesus is calling our attention to begin to live with an eternal perspective. Not just living from now. No, with the rewards, he said, look, there is something more than meets the human eye. Don't look at the pressure on the outside. Don't look at the pressure on the inside. Stand your ground because there is more ahead of you in the eternal life, in the kingdom to come than what it is now. There is more than meets the eye than what it is looking now. And brothers and sisters, this is a call for us to switch out of this uh, natural sphere and focus in the spirit. And see from the reality of the kingdom. And make our decisions and live our lives from that reality. The letter to the church in Pergamon. Lessons from the letters to the seven churches. We must have a right spiritual understanding and perspective of our culture. We must stand our ground when it comes to internal and external pressure. We must refuse any kind of teaching that encourages us. To be haphazard in our commitment to the Lord. We must recognize that is a teaching that will deplete our allegiance and our loyalty to our King and our Lord. This is a call to rise up and to take arms from the one who has the words in his mouth. That word, that two-edged, sharp, two-edged sword. He's calling us to take our spiritual authority and to stand and to persevere and to see his kingdom invade this world like never before. In Jesus' name, let's pray. Father, we thank you. King Jesus, we thank you right now. Master, we glorify your holy name. Thank you for your word today. Thank you that you are calling us here in Wessex to rise up, O oh God. To rise up and not to have a mixed allegiance, but to have one allegiance to you and loyalty. Because you purchased us with your blood. Nobody did. Nobody paid. You alone paid. Help us today with humility so that we will receive your word. And that if there is any repentance that we need to do, we would do that individually and corporately as a church. Oh, Father, help me as your, your leader that you will give me a heart of fire 
to stand and to speak your truth, regardless of what the consequence is. Because you have called me, you called me, not anyone, not anything. Give me the grace to stand my ground, even when everyone is in opposition to it. Father, help us to stand in this culture. Help us to be the light of this world as we live and as we see your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. We give you praise and we give you glory right now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you so much. God bless you. Uh, I look forward to seeing you during the dialogue on Wednesday. I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you. Go back and listen to this message again. Share it with your friends. Discuss it. If you've got any questions, please do. Don't hesitate. Give me a shout. I, I, I'm believing God with you. I'm praying with you that God will continue to strengthen you and to empower you and to give you courage to stand your ground in this end time, in this great time, so that we can see the kingdom of God invade our nation, this nation, United Kingdom, like never before. And thank you so much to everyone who graciously uh, continues to give financially to enable us to, to do this and to continue to bring the word of the Lord. There's great things that God has for us. And again, I want to encourage you, please do pray for me.